it works for, for attending phase social science Korea global Marxism online talk. I am Song Jin Jung, a moderator of this talk. I am a professor of economics at Yongsang National University and chief of researcher of SS18, SS uh, post capitalism and uh, the innovation of Marxism, hosting this talk program. I am very pleased to invite Professor Fred Mosley, so world distinguished Marxist economist and my longtime friend as a speaker for today's talk. Fred Mosley is currently an emeritus uh, professor of Mount Holyoke College in the United States. And he is the author and the editor of numerous books on Marx theory, including The Falling Rate of Profit in the Post War United States Economy, published in 1991, and Marx's Logical Method, Heterodox Economic Theories, New Investigations of Marx Method, and the Marx Theory of Money. And most recently, Saboni and the Totality is published in 2015. He also edited and wrote an introduction to the English edition of Mega Section 4.4. It's about the economy manuscript of 1864-65, published in 2015. So <clears throat> last March at this SSK. Global Marxism Online talk, Fred gave a talk on his recent uh, book that I mentioned, Money and Totality. And you can listen to uh, Fred's this talk uh, and related discussions on YouTube. Uh, today, Fred will comment on uh, Michael Heine's post-coming book. Actually, it's uh, published in uh, original German edition and also in Korean edition already. And it's a uh, forthcoming English is, uh, edition. It's a uh, book. So uh, it's under the title of this Box Abstract Theory of Value and Money in Chapter One of Capital, a critic of a highly value form interpretation. Uh, Fred will uh, present about uh, 40 minutes. Fred, uh, welcome and you have a call. Fred? Yes. yes. Uh, you, you can stop now. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Sean Jin. It's uh, uh, great to see old friends again. Thank you uh, very much for organizing this uh, interesting and important conference. I uh, also want to thank Jen Wu, especially for his uh, excellent uh, technical coordination uh, for, for this conference. Uh, so, uh, uh, as announced, uh, my paper is a, a detailed look at the logic of section one uh, of chapter one and a critique of Mikhail's interpretation. Uh, Mikhail and I have been talking, discussing uh, Marxist theory uh, off and on for many years, uh, not always about chapter one, uh, but uh, more recently, uh, mostly about chapter one. And I want to say that I have benefited greatly uh, from uh, our uh, ongoing discussions and I look forward to their continuation. Uh, I think we're making progress, uh, at least in terms of mutual understanding. Um, uh, however, our interpretations are still very, very different. Uh, um, I hope my paper will lead to further progress uh, in, in mutual understanding. Uh, and perhaps even uh, a step toward uh, partial agreement, uh, as uh, I suggested at the end of my paper. And I hope my paper also will help to clarify some of the issues involved in the interpretation of chapter one uh, uh, for the other participants as well. Okay, so I want to set up uh, a PowerPoint here, Jin Wu. Uh, so, okay, I go, I, am I allowed? Jin Wu, you have? I think okay. you are allowed to yeah, upload your PowerPoint. Okay, uh, slideshow. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so I, I, I first will start as I do in my paper, just kind of previewing uh, the four main uh, points of my paper. Uh, and I'll start off just uh, reading from the PowerPoint. Uh, uh, the first point is that the subject of chapter one is the commodity, right? That's the title. Uh, and it indicates that the subject of chapter one uh, is the properties that each commodity shares uh, with all other commodities, uh, especially the property of exchange value of each commodity and the value that is hidden behind the exchange value of each commodity. Uh, the subject of chapter one is not yet the exchange of commodities on the market. Uh, uh, chapter two, which is entitled The Process of Exchange, introduces exchange and the market uh, for the first time. Okay, the second point, the derivation of the necessity of a common property of all commodities that determines their exchange values. So the, the necessity of a common property uh, with definite magnitudes possessed by all commodities is derived from the general relation of equality of each commodity with all other commodities. This necessity of a common property is not derived from uh, an exchange of commodities and particularly the exchange of two commodities on the market as uh, Mikhail uh, seems to suggest. Uh, third point that socially necessary labor time is determined in production uh, and not uh, in exchange. The magnitude of value, the socially necessary labor time of each commodity is determined as the average labor time required to produce each commodity and is not determined uh, uh, in the exchange of commodities uh, on the market. And then fourth, uh, Marxist theory of value and surplus value in volume one generally assumes that supply is equal to demand of commodities. Uh, not actually in every period, in fact, very seldom, but as a tendency. Uh, and in order to explain uh, capitalism uh, uh, in its pure form. Uh, thus, the prices that are determined in Marxist theory are long run equilibrium prices. Uh, the equilibrium price of each commodity in volume one is determined, as Marx said, exclusively by the socially necessary labor time required to produce it and is not affected by imbalances between supply and demand. Okay, so those are the four main points. And I, I start with uh, the first point that the subject of uh, chapter one uh, is the commodity and the properties that all commodities share are what what Marx often called the dual character uh, of the commodity. Uh, and so in order to clarify uh, this subject of chapter one, I wanna first briefly review uh, Marx's introduction to the Grünrisse on his introduction entitled The Method of Political Economy. And this will help to clarify the starting point of capital in chapter one. And just very briefly, uh, Marx explained that his logical method consists of what he called two paths. Right? First, from the concrete to the abstract, uh, and then uh, the return path from the uh, abstract to the concrete. The first path begins with the actual concrete, uh, modern bourgeois society, as, as Marx called it, uh, and moves analytically from the chaotic unexplained concrete towards the ever more simple concepts, uh, e ever thinner abstractions, um, uh, until the investigation arrives at the simplest abstraction, the most abstract universal element of the concrete totality. And then the second path retraces the journey from the most abstract element back to the actual concrete but this time uh, the concrete is explained by means of uh, levels of abstraction uh, in, su in succession, incorporating more and more elements of the concrete totality. Uh, 
For Marx, the most abstract universal element of modern bourgeois society is the commodity. Right? Therefore, the starting point of Marxist theory uh, of the actual capitalist economy uh, is the commodity. Right? The title of chapter one, as they say, is the commodity. Chapter one is not uh, uh, an analysis either of the production process or of the exchange process. Chapter one is an analysis of the properties of the commodity, the main properties that the commodity shares, use value and exchange value. Right. Uh, Mikhail uh, seems to think that section one is also about the exchange of two commodities on the market. Uh, and he seems to think that, I think that section one is about the production process. Right? But I argue that section one is not about either the production process or the exchange process. Uh, sec chapter one and, and, and section one in particular is about the commodity. So in Marx's analysis of the commodity, each commodity that Marx is analyzing here, what are the properties of the commodity, uh, is assumed to have been produced, right? And to contain a certain quantity of labor time. Uh, Marx succinctly expressed this important starting point uh, of his theory of capitalism uh, in his summary of volume one uh, in the results manuscript uh, in which Marx said, um, we began uh, with an individual commodity viewed as an autonomous article in which uh, a specific amount of labor time is objectified and which therefore has an exchange value of a definite amount. Okay, this, this is the starting point of, uh, of uh, chapter one, uh, a, a commodity that has been produced um, uh, and contains a definite amount of labor time. Uh, Mikhail's general interpretation uh, is that commodities do not possess value until they are actually exchanged on the market, if I understand correctly. However, uh, the sentence from the results uh, indicates that the starting point of Marxist theory is a commodity that has been produced but not yet exchanged, and then this commodity is assumed to have an exchange value uh, of a definite amount as a result of its, of its production, uh, which seems to contradict uh, Mikhail's uh, interpretation. Okay, then the second point, uh, the necessity uh, of a common property of commodities that determines their exchange values is derived from the general relation of equality of each commodity and all other commodities uh, uh, and, and is not uh, derived from the exchange, the actual exchange of two commodities on the market. Now, the title of section one, you're all familiar, just to remind you, uh, uh, is the two factors of the commodity, right? Use value and exchange value. Uh, and then uh, the fundamental properties of the substance and magnitude of value of each and every commodity. Uh, the, the subject of, of uh, section one is not the exchange of commodities in the market. Market is not considered until chapter two. Okay, so section one then begins with an analysis of a representative commodity. The, what Marx called the elementary form of an immense collection of commodities, which is the result of capitalist production. Now, after a brief discussion of the use value of the commodity, Marx moves on to the main subject, an analysis of the exchange value of the commodity, uh, the most important property. Then the next paragraph, uh, top of page 127 on the Penguin edition. Uh, is a very important one in which Marx elaborates 
that each commodity, for example, a quarter of wheat, uh, can in theory be exchanged, is, is exchangeable with many other commodities, not just one commodity, many other commodities in definite proportions. And therefore, a commodity, each commodity, a quarter of wheat, for example, has not just one exchange value uh, with one commodity, but instead has many exchange values, as, as many exchange values as there are other commodities. Right? Uh, and since the exchange value of a quarter of wheat represents the exchange value, since all of the different exchange values of a quarter of wheat represent the exchange value of a quarter of wheat, uh, uh, these exchange values of a quarter of wheat must themselves be what Marx calls mutually uh, replaceable and uh, of identical magnitude. These different exchange values of a quarter of wheat uh, are mutually replaceable or they're equal of uh, uh, identical magnitude. Therefore, Marx reaches the important conclusion at the end of this paragraph that you see on the slide there, uh, that each commodity is in theory equal to all other commodities uh, in definite proportions. Uh, um, and uh, this general equality uh, is, the, is the fundamental nature of commodities and is the basis for uh, the rest of Marx's theory of value. And Marx argues in the rest of this important paragraph uh, that such a general relation of equality between all commodities, each commodity equal to all other commodities implies, requires that each commodity must possess some common property that determines their many exchange values, i.e. that determines the quantities in which they are equals. All commodities, uh, Marx says, are mutually replaceable and of identical magnitude. So we can uh, uh, read uh, Marx's uh, uh, sentence. Uh, conclusion of this important, uh, the conclusion being that each commodity is in theory uh, equal to all other commodities, a general relationship of equality between all commodities. Then the next paragraph uh, you're familiar with uh, is another important paragraph in which Marx illustrates the general relation of equality discussed in the previous paragraph uh, uh, with a specific relation of equality between two commodities uh, that can be expressed uh, in a simple equation. Uh, very important, uh, uh, let me read uh, part of it. It follows from this. Firstly, that the valid exchange values of a particular commodity express something equal. Uh, and secondly, uh, exchange values cannot be anything other than uh, the mode of expression of a form of appearance, uh, of uh, a content distinguishable from it. I fell behind a slide there, sorry. That was the conclusion of the previous um, the general uh, paragraph on the general equality of all commodities. And then the next paragraph uh, is the, the example, the illustration of the general equality with uh, 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 an equality of two commodities that can be represented by an equation. And this equation signifies that this is, is clearer than the previous paragraph, signifies that a common element of identical mag magnitude exist in the two different things. Okay, so this is the same conclusion Marx reached in the previous paragraph, uh, but uh, it is uh, uh, more clearly stated. Now here, this, this I think uh, I've realized in recent weeks that this paragraph in particular seems to be a major disagreement uh, between Mikhail and myself. We can, I hope we can clarify this. Uh, Mikhail seems to interpret the term exchange relation 
in the second line there of the text uh, uh, in a different way than I, and, and, and he interprets it as an actual act of exchange on the market uh, between corn and iron, right? The, um, uh, uh, one of his sentences, he says, here the two values are equated in exchange, in the act of exchange, right? However, I argue that this is not Marx's meaning of the exchange relation, right? So we have uh, a disagreement here about uh, the meaning of the term uh, exchange relation. I argue instead that exchange relation uh, uh, in this sentence and elsewhere uh, is a synonym for exchange value, right? And exchange value is the form of appearance of the value of a commodity. Right. So, just a couple of examples of uh, these two of exchange relation and exchange value being used as synonyms. On the next page, uh, 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 after this sentence, this paragraph just quoted, um, that's that's Mikhail's interpretation. Um, uh, one such uh, passage on page 128, the common factor in the exchange relation or alternatively in the exchange value of the commodity is therefore its value. And then uh, in the introduction to section three, the next uh, short text, uh, uh, referring back to volume one, again, a familiar text, I think, marks again, clearly expresses uh, these two terms as synonyms. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Marx says, we started from exchange value or uh, the exchange relation of commodities in order to track down the value that lay hidden within it. Now we must return to the form of appearance of value to the exchange, to the exchange value or to the exchange relation. So I argue exchange relation is a synonym for the exchange values and does not mean uh, a, an act of exchange on the market. So uh, let me elaborate that point that's important disagreement a bit, my point of view, uh, and, and review uh, the logic of section one so far. Uh, Marx began section one with an analysis after use value of the exchange value. Right? That's, that's the starting point, this property, this crucial property, the exchange value of each commodity, which is defined with many exchange values as a general relation of equality of each commodity with all other commodities without considering an actual act of exchange. Right? It's just the, the, the nature of the commodity is that it is equivalent to uh, all other commodities. Uh, and then these exchange values of the quarter of wheat uh, are taken as given, right? In Marx's analysis, they're just, like Marx says, let us say, right? Uh, uh, and, and these exchange values are not determined uh, uh, in an actual exchange on the market. They're just taken as given. And then Marx argued that this general relation of equality of each commodity with all other commodities implies that all commodities must possess a common property and a specific amount of this common property, again, without a consideration of the actual exchange on the market. The necessity of a common property follows from the general relation of equality and not from uh, uh, an actual exchange. Uh, and finally, the, the, the paragraph on the illustration, the example, the relation of equality between two commodities uh, uh, is an example of the general relation of equality of all commodities discussed in the previous section. And again, without consideration of an actual act of exchange, continuing the same logic. So Marx derived the necessity of a common property of commodities from the nature of commodities as exchange values. Right, or one could say from the nature of commodities as equivalents, as general equivalents, and not from an actual exchange on the market. 
He's just analyzing a commodity and its properties, and especially the, uh, the property of exchange value as a general relation of equality of each commodity and all other commodities. So actual acts of exchange uh, on the market uh, are not considered, as I mentioned, by Marx until chapter two. Right? The title of chapter two is the process of exchange. Right? And, and uh, chapter two uh, uh, begins with these two sentences. Commodities cannot take themselves to the market. Therefore, we must have recourse to their guardians who are the possessors of commodities. So it seems to me that these sentences imply that the exchange of commodities on the market is not considered yet in chapter one, right? Uh, there are no commodity owners in chapter one and commodities cannot take themselves to the market, right? Chapter two introduces the commodity producers for the first time and the commodity producers take commodities to the market for the first time, and the process of exchange in the market is analyzed for the first time. Okay, so I'm sure we have lots to talk about there, uh, but let me move on. The, the, the third point has to do with the determination of uh, socially necessary labor time, uh, and I argue that uh, it, uh, socially necessary labor time is determined in production. Uh, and, and, and so Marx uh, argues in the next two pages that this common property that he's already derived uh, is objectified abstract labor, assumptions of value. Uh, and you're all familiar with this conclusion uh, that um, uh, the common property of commodities that determines their exchange value is the human labor expended to produce them, or what more, the human labor that is accumulated in them. Nothing is said in this fundamental definition of the substance of value about exchange on the market. And we're, of course, back to chapter one now. Uh, then, and the next paragraph I want to emphasize. Uh, is, is very important for this issue of the determination of socially necessary labor time, right? And it is a transition paragraph from Marx's derivation of objectified abstract labor as a substance of value in the previous two pages to a discussion of the magnitude of value, the determination of the magnitude of value by socially necessary labor time in the pages to follow. Right? So in this paragraph on the screen now, uh, Marx briefly restates his previous conclusion uh, and then previews his later uh, derivation in section three of money as the necessary form of appearance of value. Uh, and he notes in the last sentence that I wanna emphasize, quote, we must first consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. Okay, so we can see again, again that exchange relation uh, and exchange value are synonyms and also the form of appearance of value is uh, also is uh, exchange value. Uh, uh, so all of these, these terms are synonyms. So when Marx writes in the last sentence, that we must first consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. This means we must first consider the nature of value independent of its exchange value or independently of its exchange relation. And indeed, indeed, in the pages that follow, this is what Marx does, right? He discusses the determination of the magnitude of value each commodity, uh, each commodity uh, possesses independently of its exchange value uh, or the exchange relation uh, with another commodity in the page in the discussion of the determination of socially necessary labor time. And one could even say that even with Mikhail's interpretation of exchange relation as an act of exchange on the market, Marx's statement uh, in this passage would mean that in the discussion that follows, the nature of value and you know, the, the magnitude of value is considered 
independently on uh, uh, of exchange on the market. Right. So the, the, the discussion about the determination of socially necessary labor time explicitly excludes uh, consideration of exchange values or exchange on the market. Uh, in his forthcoming book, uh, which Mikhail was uh, good enough to send me an advanced copy, and I've been poring over it the last few weeks, uh, 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 in, in this book, Mikhail does not comment on this important last sentence, uh, uh, unless I missed it somehow, uh, that we must consider the nature of value independently of its exchange relation. But this sentence seems to contradict Mikhail's interpretation that socially necessary labor time does not exist independently of the act of exchange. Okay, then uh, some familiar passages uh, on the next page. Uh, Marx defines the, the magnitude of value. Uh, uh, running a little short on time, so I'll uh, skip over uh, the, the very familiar. And then the, the, the next paragraph is the definition of socially necessary labor time, right? Uh, the, the fundamental definition, the labor time required to produce uh, any use value under conditions of production normal for a given society, society etc. So again, Nothing is said in this fundamental definition of socially necessary labor time about exchange uh, as a determinant of uh, socially necessary labor time. And uh, one more paragraph. Uh, the next paragraph I want to emphasize, uh, uh, that, and Marx says, what exclusively determines the magnitude of any article is therefore the amount of labor socially necessary or labor time socially necessary for its production. And uh, I mean, exclusively determines certainly seems to mean uh, that socially necessary labor time does not depend on any other factor besides uh, the labor, average labor time in production uh, and including uh, excludes uh, supply and demand in exchange. In his uh, uh, forthcoming book, uh, Mikhail seems to acknowledge that Marx does not say anything about socially necessary labor time depending on exchange uh, in section one, as I have pointed out. Uh, however, he makes two arguments that socially necessary labor time uh, is nonetheless determined in, uh, in exchange in Marx's theory. Excuse me. The first argument is that socially necessary labor time is the average labor time in an industry. And the average labor time depends on the normal conditions of production. And normal conditions of production depend on which commodities are actually brought to the market out of all the commodities produced in an industry. And I argue that this is a distinction without a real difference. Uh, there's no significant difference in general, normally, between goods produced and goods uh, brought on the market. Uh, the normal situation is that all the goods produced uh, in an industry are brought uh, to the market. Uh, 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 why would producers produce commodities and not bring them to the market, at least that this would happen on a regular basis? And how significant could this be? Mikhail does not present that I saw any reason why producers who have produced commodities do not bring them to the mar market, nor does he present any textual evidence from any of Marx's writings to support this uh, uh, idiosyncratic interpretation. Uh, and we saw above that Marx clearly states on the, the, the key paragraph I emphasized at the bottom of page 128, that socially necessary labor time is determined independently of exchange, which would seem to rule out this first argument. Right. Um, then my fourth and final point, and uh, has to do with Mikhail's second and more important argument, 
uh, that socially necessary labor time depends on exchange because uh, if the supply of the commodity produced uh, exceeds the demand, uh, then this would reduce the socially necessary labor time of each commodity in that industry, which is a familiar argument uh, um, uh, in uh, the value form interpretation of Marx's theory. And the main textual evidence that Mikhail presents to support his interpretation uh, uh, is not from chapter one, but instead from chapter three in section two on money as the means of circulation. And the passage is the following. Right? If the market cannot stomach its normal price of two shillings a yard, this proves too great a portion of the total social labor time has been expended in the form of weaving, uh, uh, et cetera. Now, the point I want to emphasize about this passage is that it starts with the normal price of the linen. Right? And the normal price is the average price uh, at which supply is equal to demand. So the normal price is what we would call today the equilibrium price of the linen, the center of gravity price around which market prices fluctuate, right? Uh, in this case, uh, uh, in the case when supply is equal to demand, then even with Michael, Mikhail's uh, interpretation of socially necessary labor time, socially necessary labor time would still not be affected by supply and demand on the market because they're equal, right? And most importantly, the normal, the normal price uh, is determined by the socially necessary labor time as the average labor time in production. And I argue this is what Marx's theory of value in volume one is generally about, right? Abstract, normal equilibrium prices that depend only on the average labor time in production at the abstract level of volume one. Now, but most importantly, I wanna emphasize here, in the case when supply exceeds demand, right? Then the market price will be less than the normal price, right? But the normal price will remain the same. Right. will still be two shillings. And the normal price continues to be determined solely by socially necessary labor time in production, right? So the, 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 the normal price is not affected by the imbalance in equality between supply and demand. What is infected by, what is affected by this inequality are market prices that fluctuate around the normal price. The normal price is, as Marx said, exclusively determined by socially necessary labor time in production. Mikhail does not discuss that uh, I have found uh, the meaning and significance of the normal price uh, uh, in this passage uh, and in Marx's theory in general, which I regard as a serious weakness uh, of Mikhail's interpretation. In, instead, he seems to interpret Marx's theory of value uh, as about disequilibrium market prices that depend on supply and demand, and also that he defines socially necessary labor time as also depending on supply and demand and associated with disequilibrium prices. However, on the very next page, after this uh, passage uh, uh, quoted by Mikhail, Marx concluded his discussion of several pages of uh, supply and demand uh, as follows. Oh, I, I, yeah, okay, I have skipped over slide. Here's, here's the, the, the key passage I wanna emphasize here, however, we have to look at the phenomenon in its pure state and must therefore assume that it has proceeded normally. And I think this is a quite general statement uh, that in the analysis that follows this statement, and indeed I would argue uh, in all three volumes of capital, Marx assumes in general with digressions and so forth, but in general, systematically uh, that uh, uh, supply is equal to demand. Uh, again, not actually, but as a tendency. Uh, 
And Marx's theory of value is about normal equilibrium prices that are the center of gravity of market prices. Uh, and uh, in volume one, those uh, equilibrium prices are determined solely by socially necessary labor, labor time in production. Now, five, five more minutes or so, uh, Sean Jin, I'm, I'm uh, uh, getting close to the end here, but I want to emphasize, okay. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so after, after this statement that uh, we are, as we proceed, we will assume that uh, 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 the economy is proceeding normally in its pure shape. And two chapters later, in a long and important footnote at the end of chapter five, leading up to his theory of surplus value in chapter seven, Marx stipulated that his theory of surplus value is based on the assumption that price is equal to average price, right? And average price is what he previously called normal price uh, that assumes that supply is equal to demand. Uh, and he stated again that this assumption, similar to the passage in chapter three, that this assumption enables him to explain the phenomenon in its purity. And he added, uh, it also enables him, us, to prevent our observations from being interfered with by disturbing incidental circumstances, uh, which, which are irrelevant. Uh, so this, this uh, long and important footnote is too long to put on a slide, uh, but the whole footnote is on my paper and I hope you will read it carefully. It's, uh, very important, sets the stage for the theory of surplus value in the rest of the volume. Uh, and just a few excerpts uh, to summarize, uh, uh, the footnote says that the theory of the formation of capital assumes exchange at values, right? Uh, and exchange of values means exchange uh, at average prices. And average prices assume that supply is equal to demand. So prices, and Marx describes prices that are not equal to values as accidental and incidental and are disregarded in order to explain the production of surplus value uh, in its purity without these distractions. He also says that uh, uh, the average prices are the internal regulator of market prices and, and what he calls the guiding light of capitals uh, in their investment uh, decisions. And therefore, uh, uh, the, the average prices are more important uh, than the market prices and more important for a theory to explain. Okay, so in the final section of my paper, then I suggest that uh, I would, uh, uh, in a spirit of, uh, in an ecumenical spirit, uh, be willing to accept uh, a second concept of socially necessary labor time, similar to Mikhail's, that does depend on demand and supply in exchange and is associated with disequilibrium market prices rather than equilibrium prices and applies to a lower level of abstraction than the three volumes of capital. However, I will continue to argue that Marx's theory of value and surplus value and prices of production in the three volumes of capital assume that supply is equal to demand and abstracts systematically from the accidental and incidental circumstances of supply uh, not equal to demand. Uh, and that the equilibrium prices, uh, finally, not only is Marx's theory primarily about uh, the equilibrium normal average prices, but these average prices, uh, equilibrium prices are exclusively determined by the average labor time in production, uh, which is uh, 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 the primary concept of socially necessary labor time. Although uh, I, uh, and willing to accept a different meaning of the words socially necessary and uh, accommodate that interpretation as well at a lower level of abstraction. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Oh, Fred. Well, thank you very much for the it's a very exciting talk. Uh, your uh, clear and uh, critical review of um, Michael Heine's forthcoming 
commentary book on Marx, first two chapters of Capital Volume 1, is very helpful to understand the differences between you and Michael Heine on Marx's theory of value, as well as your own position. Uh, your differentiation of Marx's concept of socially necessary labor time uh, into two, uh, two concepts of socially necessary labor time is an equilibrium, equilibrium concept and the disequilibrium concept and attempting to resolve the differences between you and Heine, uh, I think especially remarkable. But thank you very much again for the very interesting and the sort provoking talk. Uh, uh, before open discussion to the floor, uh, uh, it will be great uh, if uh, Michael, uh, Michael uh, is uh, attended uh, today's uh, talk. Mr. Michael, I need could uh, respond to Fred's critique. Even if it is four o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> his time. Thank you very much, Raquel. <laughs> so, Michael. So now, now oh. you can hear me. Oh, yes. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, it's indeed uh, rather late. And uh, Fred uh, presented um, a lot of uh, thoughts and critics and uh, connections. If I would try to, to answer to all of them, I would need at least uh, also uh, 40 or 50 minutes. Um, perhaps it would be too, too less. Um, I, Fred presented a lot of points, but also I think he didn't occupy with some points which are very important for me, for example, what you can find in this uh, commentary, which is published, is Marx's uh, reworking manuscript from 1870 to 71, where Marx gives a, a kind of self-critique of his uh, presentation. And um, I was especially inspired by this text for my interpretation. And when I uh, saw it correctly, Fred, I, I think there is no, um, you, you didn't rely to, to this text of Marx in your paper and in your uh, talk now. But, okay, I, I want to focus on, on uh, uh, some rather basic points. And so I will start with the question, what is the issue of chapter one? I think this is for, for our differences and a very important point. And when I understood you correctly, then you want to say that in chapter one, Marx is dealing with the commodity without relation to exchange. And when Marx speaks about exchange relation, he means exchange value, but again, without relation to exchange. And this, I would say, is simply not possible. You cannot speak of exchange value without exchange. Because when I say, like, for example, the, the examples of Marx, uh, a quarter of wheat has as exchange value uh, x boot pullish. Why he can say this? Because a quarter of wheat exchanges with x boot pullish. And also like Marx introduced exchange value on page 126 in, in the uh, Penguin edition, Exchange, now I quote, exchange value appears first of all uh, as the quantitative relation, the proportion in which use values of one kind exchange for use values of another kind. So when you already speak about exchange value, you presuppose a certain exchange. And in so far, I would say your basic assumption that in chapter one, we have 
we, we talk about commodity and exchange value, but without exchange is simply not possible. Now, I, I stressed very much in my book, and, and you, you quoted this, the difference between exchange relation and exchange process. And you now also stress the, the methodological considerations of the introduction of uh, 57, with these two paths from the concrete to the abstract, and then from the abstract to the concrete. Let's have a, a little bit a, a closer look to, to these two paths when we talk about the commodity. When we take, when, when we have a look to the first three chapters of capital, what is the concrete totality? This concrete totality, first concrete totality, is an expression Marx used in Grundrisse for the circulation of commodities. The circulation process of commodities, as it is um, analyzed in chapter three in Capital, is this first concrete totality, interconnected chains of exchange, commodity, money, commodity, money, commodity, and so on. And here Marx is doing the first abstraction from these interconnected exchange processes. He goes as a kind of abstract core to the exchange process. Commodity owners exchange commodities. One of this commodity maybe is the money commodity. This exchange process executed by uh, commodity owners is the object of chapter two. But from this exchange process, Marx makes another um, a step of, of abstraction. He takes as a core of the exchange process, the exchange relation. The exchange process is commodity owner one takes commodity A and exchange this commodity A against commodity B, perhaps the money commodity. I don't speak about barter as you suppose. Commodity A against commodity B, which belongs to commodity owner number two. So we have two commodity owners, two commodities. And chapter one, in, in my view, just focuses on this exchange relation between commodity A and commodity B. So I think the, the first pass of, of, um, of the scientific method you, you quoted from uh, introduction of 57 is exactly this circulation of commodities, exchange process of commodities, or exchange process executed by exchange owners, and the core of this exchange relation of the commodities where we abstract from the commodity owners. So this means we are still occupied with exchange. And when Marx speaks then of an individual commodity or a single commodity, it is always the commodity inside this commodity, uh, this, this exchange relation or this exchange process. What you are talking about, the commodity without exchange, I would say this is just a use value. This is not a commodity, it is a use value. And when you start with exchange value, then already you need an exchange relation and exchange relation, it is not identical with barter, as you say, exchange relation is the core, the abstract core of the exchange process, exchange process, abstract core of commodity circulation. This is in, in my idea of um, the connection of the three, of the three chapters. 
um, talking about magnitude of value, I think first we have to talk about substance of value. Substance of value, as you also stressed, um, is abstract labor. But where exists abstract labor? When Marx introduces the, the notion of abstract labor in, in chapter one, the, the substance of value in, in the first uh, subsection of, of chapter one, he already um, supposes the, um, the exchange relation. He asks, we abstract from all the use value, what remains in these things? When you read, always he is using the plural. There are exchanged products. We, exchange, we abstract from the use value what remains from these things, plural. And why you have the plural? Because this abstraction only happens in exchange. In the reworking manuscript of uh, the year 7071, Marx states this explicitly and he inserts this sentence also in the French translation of capital. There you can find this sentence in the section on um, fetishism. There Marx writes, this reduction of concrete labor to abstract labor happens only when the two commodities are equalized in exchange. So we can speak about abstract labor only in exchange and not before exchange. And in so far, and now I, I will uh, finish, also the notion of socially necessary labor time and so on has an immanent relation to exchange. It is not a production, purely production determined uh, um, thing, but this is, is a consequence. I try to, to um, focus on the basic uh, differences. What is, what is chapter one? about, is it possible to, take, to speak about exchange value without exchange? And abstract labor, at least after his self-critique, Marx is very clear, abstract labor exists only in the real equalization of the commodity and these real equalizations of commodity happens in exchange. Oh. Michael? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. No, I, I, I stop here. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I don't want to, uh, to talk another hour. Oh, yeah, thanks uh, very much. So, uh, Sean Jin, oh. uh, maybe can, can I just respond briefly? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and then Michael can go to bed. Oh. Uh, so, uh, after overtime here, uh, uh, a lot of overtime. Uh, um, in the, the manuscript of 7071, uh, I have uh, studied that, uh, thanks to you, uh, uh, quite a bit now. And I've written, uh, I have a work, you know, a, a writing in process of about 30 pages or so. Uh, and so I will, I will send that to you. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, the, the, the kind of uh, immediate argument against that uh, is that those notes did not find did not significantly change the second edition, right? And 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 then uh, the uh, other editions were just uh, repeats of that. Or we can talk about that. But I think uh, uh, I I uh, I know you emphasized that manuscript, uh, but I'm not uh, persuaded. Uh, and, and so I think we're going to have to look at the details uh, here. Um, and um, then uh, the, the, the core issue of can you talk about uh, exchange value? 
without talking about exchange, right? And, and uh, I think uh, maybe part of the issue here is, uh, are we talking about a, a theoretical, a hypothetical, a possible potential exchange, right? Or are we talking about an actual exchange, right? That has taken place, right? Because as I understand it, uh, when, when you're talking about exchange, you are talking about uh, an actual exchange because your interpretation is it's only with an actual exchange that uh, uh, commodities, uh, the, that the value of commodities is determined, right? And, and, and not just theoretically, but actually in, in an actual exchange, right? Whereas I think what Marx is talking about when he says the exchange value uh, 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 is the quantity of another commodity that it exchanges for, I think Marx is talking about a potential hypothetical value from uh, uh, exchange from the nature of the commodity. The commodity is, it's, it's, it's basic, I mean, the, 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 the title of section one, the subject of section one is the, the commodity, right? And, and the commodity is in its nature uh, uh, exchangeable with all other commodities and therefore equal to all other commodities. And it is this you know, theoretical, uh, abstract uh, relation of equality that is the basis for the derivation of uh, abstract labor and socially necessary labor time, et cetera. And uh, uh, your uh, interpretation of uh, socially necessary labor time determined in exchange requires, as I understand it, uh, 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 an actual exchange where the abstraction actually takes place. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Act right. Actual well, ex exchange. What? Act I, I agreed with you with the actual right. exchange. Right, right. And, and, and I think in, in, in chapter one, Marx is not talking about an actual exchange that has taken place. Let's we'll add that phrase. That has taken place and therefore uh, 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 concrete labor is actually abstract, uh, reduced to uh, abstract labor, as as you emphasize, right? So uh, uh, I, I I hope I make myself clear enough that that there is a a, a, a possible uh, uh, disagreement about what exactly is meant by exchange. And when Marx says a commodity is exchangeable with this and that and the other, right? These are hypothetical. This is Marx saying the commodity is by its nature uh, uh, exchangeable. Uh, with all other commodities and therefore uh, uh, equal to all other commodities. And Mikhail, the, 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 the further conclusions, right? I hope you'll agree with me on this. The further conclusion about the necessity of a common property, right? Especially, right? That that conclusion follows from a general relation of equality, right? You don't need an actual exchange. Right. If you start uh, with uh, the uh, assumption that each commodity is, in principle, in theory, uh, uh, exchangeable, equal to all other commodities, then it follows right, that uh, there must be a common property. Right now, you know, you say, well, there's, there's another derivation there, too, that is based on actual exchange. Right, but I would say that's not necessary. First of all, that's not what Marx is doing. And secondly, it's not necessary. He's already in the previous paragraph uh, derived uh, the, common, the necessity of a common property from the general relation of equality without actual exchanges. Um, can I repeat oh, 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 uh, briefly yes. Yes. To, to this? Um, Fred, now you introduced a new um, distinction between uh, 
actual exchange and uh, theoretical or hypothetical uh, exchange. I think I didn't saw this distinction in your paper and I cannot find such a distinction in Marx, neither in the, the first chapter nor and somewhere else, Marx writes anything about actual real exchange and hypothetical exchange. What I uh, quoted before from page 126 and 127, Marx just talks about exchange, these commodities exchange. And in so far, um, I, I don't think that this a distinction between actual and hypothetical exchange makes sense. Um, what I think makes exchange, what ma makes sense is when you, um, when you think of this pass of, uh, from the concrete to the abstract and from the abstract to the concrete is the difference in levels of abstraction. When you think of the third chapter of capital, commodity circulation, I, I suppose we agree there we have it to do with a lot of concrete acts of selling and uh, uh, buying commodities. When we look what is Marx doing in the first uh, chapter, I would say the, the issue, the point, the theme is still this commodity uh, circulation, but on a very abstract level, the abstract level of the exchange relation of commodities. So it is still the actual exchange, but treated on an abstract level. What changes are the levels of abstraction, but there is not a change between a uh, uh, real or actual exchange and theoretical, hypothetical exchange. This I cannot see um, anywhere. No, um, I would, I, I, I would say just that... one, oh, yes. one, okay. se one sentence just uh, to, to your first point of is the reworking manuscript. Uh, you said you could not see that the reworking manuscript 7071 um, influences the second edition. I think it influences it heavily, uh, especially when Marx changes from value substance from gemeinsam to gemeinschaftlich. Unfortunately, both words have the same English translation. And so this, this change is not visible. In, in English uh, capital editions. Gemeinsam is common, gemeinschaftlich is communally, in community. And this is a big difference because a common uh, attribute, for example, a red apple and a red car have both the attribute red independently from each other. But when I speak of gemeinschaftlich, in community, for example, I can say my wife and I, we own together a car. So we don't own a car individually, we own it only as a community. And in this sense, Marx in the second edition speaks of value as a communal attribute. The single commodity has no value or even we cannot talk about the single commodity is the, the sense of this. And this is oh, one important, there are other changes, but this is one important change, I think. Okay, H how do you interpret the passage on 128 when Marx says, uh, now we're gonna examine the nature of value independently of uh, other commodities? Yeah, it, it, um, independently from the, the form of appearance. We speak of abstract labor. This is, um, I, I don't see there any problems 
when you say there is a content with uh, a certain uh, form of appearance, you make already a difference between content and form of appearance. And then you, of course, can do an investi investigation of the content independently from the form of appearance. But I think what you mean is when I abstract from the form of appearance, then I abstract from exchange. And here I don't agree. We, no, we, abstra we abstract from form of appearance, but we don't abstract from exchange. Well, but the socially necessary labor time is then described as applying to an article, any article, a single commodity, right, as the labor time required to produce it, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I think but, that... Okay, okay, this is the, the question. Where is the social, socially necessary labor time determined? It is not, in, in my view, not determined in production alone and socially necessary labor time is not the only uh, um, factor which determines magnitude of value. In the second subsection of um, uh, the first chapter, Marx introduces the difference between complex and uh, simple labor. So when I say, even if I would know um, the, the socially necessary labor time to produce a certain table and the socially necessary labor time to produce a certain trousers. I didn't know, I wouldn't know anything about the magnitude of value because I don't know if uh, the work of a carpenter and the work of a tailor is um, on the same level of complexity of labor. Are they both simple labor? Are they both uh, complex labor? This I don't know when I know um, just labor hours. So the thing I think is more complicated and you need exchange. Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, think that the socially, you don't know uh, what the relation is between two different values, but Marx assumes that those relationships exist uh, in production uh, and no, then- Not in production. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's, he said, determined exclusively uh, was what Marx said in- uh, Yeah, uh, but, in but Fred, this exclusively is wrong because just you, you can just take the the second subsection of um, of of um, the first chapter. There comes complex and simple labor, and the relation between complex and simple labor also determines the magnitude of value. Yes, and Marx. And in so far, you cannot say what Marx says in, in uh, section one of chapter one already exclusively determines uh, the magnitude of value. I think he's assuming in chapter one that those relationships between skilled and simple labor are taken as given and, and yeah, determined in, in, and, and okay, in, in production. But in section two, he doesn't assume this. And section two also belongs to, to chapter one. It is not a kind of surface of, of capitalist production. Well, I, I think he, he, he says that it's intensified labor, it's multiplied labor, it's, it's, which is presupposed. Right. And presuppose yeah, but, he is still, he is still considering he is still considering uh, 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 based on that passage on one twenty eight uh, the nature of value independently of exchange relation independently of uh, exchange value that that yeah, it, that continues to be the case until section three when uh, the form of value uh, yeah okay. Is, uh, 
Fred, but this, as I said before, when Marx says, let's consider value independently from the appearance um, of value, you identify this remark with value independently from exchange. But Marx didn't say this. No, he says independently of uh, uh, the exchange, the form of appearance, which is a synonym of the exchange relation. And you define the exchange relation as exchange. Okay, and this I disagree. Exchange relation is not the same as exchange value. Exchange relation is the basis of exchange value. When you have an ex only when you have an exchange relation, you can talk about exchange value. Well, Marx but, used but the opposite is wrong. Um, you can talk about exchange relation without talking about exchange value. So uh, this is another case where Marx was wrong, right? Uh, because Marx uh, equated the two, right? He said the exchange relation or the exchange value uh, of the commodity. So uh, uh, this uh, sounds to me like he is uh, uh, equating them, treating them as synonyms. But when you, when you read uh, chapter one, you cannot trust um, substitute the one word with the other. You, you would change the meaning of a lot of uh, sentences. You, you can do the test. Well, uh, I, that's, that's what I've tried to do. <laughs> you know, in, in the passages that I quoted and uh, another one or two in the paper uh, where uh, 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 exchange relation and exchange value uh, are treated synonymously. Yeah, and, and this I, I, I doubt, and you, you can do a simple test when you take the, the, the text of Marx and you, you um, substitute the one word by the other, you have a change of meaning in, in certain sentences. In your interpretation? No, in just reading. You, you can ask, you must not ask me, you can ask any reader of Capital and say, does this sentence mean the same, no matter if I use exchange relation or exchange value? Well, it depends on how you're defining those terms, right? So this is going to take a longer discussion. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. So thanks for your uh, patience, uh, Sanjay. Yeah, yeah my questions. So first, thank you very much for very so, okay, and uh, responses and also rejoinders. Yeah. Uh, we, um, personally, I learned very much from your <laughs> communications. Mm. Uh, although I know my own questions in the chat room, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think some of the questions overlap. Uh, is uh, with uh, the points uh, so already it's, uh, covered. So I would rather often the, the time, the question to throw audience. Yeah, I found a domain is also a part of leading this uh, Marxian labor value series. So I guess you have something to in Tobin. Domin? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. I did. Was that a question for me? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I can say. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the first presentation. And I now I fully understand that this difference between uh, you and uh, uh, Mikhail. So great. Yeah, yeah. So my, my question is very simple one uh, based upon your interpretation. So 
actually in our daily lives, we just see the market prices without equilibrium, without equalization of demand and supply, right? Mm -hmm. So we just yeah, so we just have uh, market prices uh, in in a disequilibrium state. So my question is, uh, based upon your interpretation, is it possible for us to start from the disequilibrium market prices to uh, going to uh, going back to value magnitude? Uh, for example, using the concept of monetary expression of labor time, uh, which you also used, okay? So uh, uh, my, my guess is that you just defined the value as the uh, hypothetical, in a hypothetical situation with uh, the equalization of demand and supply. So we have uh, two, two <coughs> concepts of socially necessary labor time, okay? Uh, as said, a social investor like time E and uh, equil in equilibrium and in disequilibrium. Okay. Yeah. So, my question is Is it possible for us to start from the uh, market prices in disequilibrium and going back to uh, socially nested labor time in equilibrium, not in disequilibrium? Well, that would be the opposite of Marx. Hmm. Right, uh, Marx starts from the abstract, uh, uh, and and then and uh, uh, disequilibrium prices would then uh, come in uh, at a later stage, uh, and I'm sure you know that. Um, so uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, do you think one can go in the other direction, and and that this would be compatible? With Marxist theory, it, it seems to me to be the opposite logical method. Hmm. Okay, but so you you think that it is impossible for us to start from prices to go back to value, right? Yes. Hmm. Okay. So actually, this is. I, I agree with Fred in this point uh, at least. Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope you will also agree, Michael, that uh, 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 that uh, uh, with my interpretation of the equilibrium price. Right. And are the not, norm not fully? Uh, why not? I mean, the equilibrium price uh, is, by definition, is a price at which supply is equal to demand, right? So, uh, uh, it, when supply is equal to demand, then they have no effect on the equilibrium price, and even when they're different, they have no effect on the equilibrium price, right? So, the equilibrium price then uh, is determined in volume one anyway, uh, uh, solely on the basis of socially necessary labor time and production, right? If, it could, if it's equilibrium, they are not affected by supply and demand. Okay, I, I, the, the case is complicated. Uh, for, for this um, issue, equilibrium prices, I, I suppose we would need um, another session. So I, I will not start to, to argument on this point. I just wanted to, uh, to, to have at least one point of agreement to your answer of, uh, to, to Dong Min. Um, right. I also would say from actual market prices, you cannot easily come back to, to value, um, determinations value uh, categories. And I appreciate you mentioning our point of agreement. And I was hoping for another uh, point of agreement. And, and that's why I answered my, I asked my question. And I, you know, I, I know it's four o'clock in the morning, your time, uh, but I hope we can discuss this further. I mean, I would like to know, because I mentioned this in, in my comments, right? That, that uh, I think 
that's that seems to be missing uh, in your interpretation. Uh, so uh, I yeah. would I would uh, hope you can address that at some point. Yeah, but Dongmin, I, I think uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, my I have further question: if if uh, Fred and Mikhail also think so, so what's the tip? What's the use of uh, the the uh, concept of socially necessary labor time? So if we cannot uh, find the uh, the the magnitude of social necessary labor time starting from uh, the market prices data, so it's it's just the concept of uh, the for the logical uh, evolution or theoretical evolution. Uh, if that is the case, what's, what uh, what should we distinguish the the uh, what's the use of the distinction between Fred's concept of socially necessary labor time and Mikhail's concept of socially less la uh, labor time? So I don't find the the, the use of the uh, distinction between you two's conception. I guess I'm saying that they can be considered compatible, right? They, they, they're compatible. different concepts. Compatible. 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 Right? Uh, mutually consistent, right? In that one concept of necessary labor time uh, determines the equilibrium price, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, which is socially necessary labor time in production, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then uh, the broader, uh, more concrete uh, concept of socially necessary labor time, which is not the labor time required to produce, but rather the labor time received by sellers of commodities, right? That, that is then, uh, you know, a, a different concept of socially necessary labor time, which explains a different price. Mm. Right, which explains the disequilibrium price. So, you know, I, 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 I think this makes sense, right? That that uh, uh, that these two concepts uh, are compatible in the sense that they explain different prices. Yeah, I understand. I fully understand what you mean, but at least from the perspective of the economy of concept, so. Uh, I rather agree with Mikhail uh, because uh, Fred introduces uh, uh, more and more concepts. I hypothetical, uh, ex hypothetical exchange and actual exchange and uh, SNLT in equilibrium and SNLT in disequilibrium. So So, so I think is 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 uh, you 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 are introducing too, uh, too many uh, concepts. So uh, unlike Marx, you know, the Marx just have uh, socially necessary labor time and value and price of production and price. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's my impression. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it, uh, I, I, you know, the the footnote at the end of chapter five. Uh, uh, explains that Marx is assuming uh, that uh, prices are equal to average prices, right? Uh -huh. uh, uh, and, and, but for a specific purpose, right? Uh, to explain surplus value, right? And that that's what all the concepts of value and socially necessary labor time uh, uh, and normal price, etc., cetera, uh, uh, are intended for, right? That that's the main question, uh, is not market prices, but surplus value, right? Uh, and so uh, Marx is uh, uh, assuming uh, away uh, accidental disturbances mm. uh, in order to explain surplus value by surplus labor time, right? So, I mean, uh, and then from the theory of surplus value, one, derives all the rest of what I regard as tremendous explanatory power uh, of Marxist theory, the 
conflict over the working day, the conflict over the intensity of labor, inherent technological change, trend and rate of, rate of profit, et cetera, right? All of that based on the fundamental uh, theory of normal price. Okay. Right? It doesn't you. explain everything, but I think yeah. it explains the most important things. Okay, thank you. And, and I will you. try, to, yeah, thank I will you. try to read your paper, full paper and uh, also uh, Mikhail's forthcoming book. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your questions and for the kind answers. And uh, as the, there's no body, no further uh, questions, I, I will not say, in fact, if you could give a, a short answer uh, to uh, my questions in the chat room is uh, not covered uh, by the discussion as of now. So that's the second one, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, uh, my question is very it's a simple question so for, just for clarification. So my second question, you tend to describe your approach to, to Marx theory of value as macro monetary interpretation, admitting the monetary aspect of Marx theory of value. Uh, Heine also described his position as a monetary theory of value. But today, your strong criticism of Heine risks identifying your position with a non monetary or substantialist theory of value that you also criticized previously. So, what do you think? And uh, the third one so, when you argue that the socially necessary labor time is determined in production prior to exchange. Does production include simple commodity production as well as uh, capitalist production? So uh, that's my answer. And uh, uh, so my so fourth question, although you uh, criticize the uh, CBRE, it's a uh, Heinrich's book, I am sure that you also think there is some positive contribution in Heinrich's book. Uh, so what do you think? Yeah. Uh, please, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my my hearing's not what it used to oh, be. Oh, yeah. uh, I wrote my my. Uh, oh, you did uh, not hear my. I question. think I think one question I think I understand uh, oh. Oh. was uh, uh, I, I seem to just be talking about uh, production and labor time and not money, right? And yet. My and I describe my uh, interpretation as macro monetary, right? Uh, but uh, you know, today's paper was uh, about section one uh, of, of chapter one, right? So uh, you know, I would certainly emphasize and have emphasized that you know the monetary part comes in in chapter one in section three. Right uh, and 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 the theory of money and the necessity of money and the value of money, uh, all of that uh, very important section three is derived from presupposed quantities of socially necessary labor time in each and every commodity that uh, was developed in section one. Right, so section one developed socially necessary labor time, and then section three presupposes the socially necessary labor time in order to explain the form of appearance of socially necessary labor time since socially necessary labor time is itself directly unobservable, right? So in order to, for commodities to, to, to signal their value, to be able to function as commodities, the socially necessary labor time must acquire a, a visible form of appearance and that's money. Right? And then the rest of the three volumes of capital is about money, right? And about how quantities of money are determined by quantities of labor time. So I hope that, uh, and then there was a second question, which I don't think I understood. Oh, uh, second, uh, my second question is about the, the uh, you argue that socially necessary labor time is determined in production prior to exchange. Uh, so does production include so-called 
simple common no, 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 just capitalism. Yeah. Just capitalism. It's capitalism. Right. So it's capitalism for, you know, the, the, so what you mean the concrete, the concrete oh. totality that Marx starts with uh, is the capitalist mode of production, mm. right? Uh, and, so, and, not, and not simple commodity production. So you also think that the SNLP, socially necessary of time, can exist only in capitalist mode of production? Well, I don't know about can only exist. Uh, I'm just saying what Marx is analyzing, okay. right, uh, is the capitalist mode of production and socially necessary labor time in capitalism. I mean, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, a simple commodity uh, production economy has ever existed, right? So I, it, it's... I mean, I guess hypothetically it could, uh, but uh, I think the important point to emphasize is that, uh, you know, Marx is analyzing capitalism from the beginning, right? Uh, and uh, the commodity is the elementary form uh, of the capitalist mode of production, right? Uh, and and, and uh, I, I would say, that then the, the commodity uh, is again the subject, the commodity, the properties of the commodity uh, is the subject of chapter one, right? And one of those properties is exchange value, right? So each commodity, that means uh, exchange value is a general relation of exchange of each commodity with all other commodities, right? And so, uh, uh, this does not mean uh, an exchange that has already taken place, right? But it means that it's in a, that this commodity exists in a general system of commodity exchange, right? And so we're we're not we're, we're talking about exchange uh, as a general phenomenon, exchange as a mode of production, right? Uh, and not a specific exchange that is converting concrete labor into abstract labor, uh, in my view. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got it. Oh, thanks very much yes, for the kind and pointy answers to my questions. And as already is the time is uh, one hour and 40 minutes. And uh, as there is no further questions, uh, I would like to close uh, today's talk. So, and, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, please allow me to advertise that this uh, Social Science Korea Global Marxism Online talk will continue so until next week. So, I will really appreciate if you could stay with us till the end of the program. Our uh, uh, thank you very much again for the great talk. And many thanks to Michael Hyman and Dongmin Liu uh, for the very important uh, uh, responses and uh, inputs. And yes, all indeed. of you, yeah, for attending the talk. And here, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. bye.